We've got one is, which has landed just here with pollen on its hind legs. There's pollen sacs there. Um, so that, that, that'll be returning with these these protein sources of food for the for the bees, for the collective. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're foraging really well. Like I said, it's, it's a really nice, bright spell of the day. So they probably are bringing back food. The guys in here, hopefully they are, are processing that nectar and storing it away. Normally the pollen will be stored more into the in the brood area. Um, so probably the, the top area we're looking at now on, on the crown board, we probably will have um, worker bees that will be processing honey, hopefully, we hope. <laughs> BSI presents The Standard Show, the podcast that brings you the stories behind the standards with Matthew Childs and Cindy Paragill. Today's episode is on bees, honey, and standards. Probably the important thing to think about setting standards for the honey is ultimately we're aiming to protect the consumer and to, to protect the bee populations as well. I mean, bees are very good pollinators. And honey actually is is an economic incentive to look after bees. So um, th these sorts of things that, that we're doing within the standards world and with honey and, and bees in general, you know, apply to, to um, developing economies in, in developing countries. And that ultimately leads to um, you know, pollinators being uh, valued. And, and when they're valued, ultimately that, that means that the, the environment in which they live is, is valued more. And that can lead to um, you know, more care being taken to, to look after the natural environment. So um, the, the honey and bee story is, is a very good one for helping people to promote um, a healthier environment. Hello and welcome to The Standard Show. My name is Matthew Childs and the aim of this podcast is to bring you the stories behind the standards. Now, at the top of the episode, we heard beekeeper Barnaby Shaw of Bee Urban a community and not-for-profit organisation based in Kennington, South East London, describing what was happening with some of his bees. And he was followed by Adrian Charlton, principal scientist from FERRA, an international science organisation in the agri-food sector. Bringing this story together, really, talking about the interrelationship between bees, honey and a healthy environment. We'll hear more from Barnaby and his bees later and from Adrian too, who tells us about some of the conversations and considerations taking place in the ISO committee, which are developing new international standards for bee products, and in particular, for honey. Barnaby and Adrian are joining this episode by Selwyn Wilkins, also a ferrer, where he's a senior bee ecotoxicologist. We'll hear from Selwyn about the importance of bees generally, and in particular, for their role as pollinators. I also get Selwyn's expert opinion on something that happened to me with bees many, many moons ago when I was a child. Now, we are publishing this episode on World Bee Day, the fifth World Bee Day, in fact, a day officially recognised by the United Nations since 2017, after being proposed by Slovenia. And they propose that a date in May be proclaimed World Bee Day because at this time of year, the Northern Hemisphere sees bees and nature getting busy, while the Southern Hemisphere enters autumn when hive products are harvested and the season of honey and honey-based products begins. But they propose 20th of May in particular because it's the birth date of Anton Jansa, a Slovenian beekeeper and a pioneer of modern beekeeping. Educated as a painter, Jansa was employed as a teacher of apiculture, the scientific method of rearing honeybees, at the Habsburg court in Vienna. In beekeeping, he is noted for changing the size and shape of hives to a form where they can be stacked together like blocks. And as a painter, he also decorated the front of his hives with paintings. In his book, A Full Guide to Beekeeping, written way back in 1775, he wrote, Among all God's beings, there are none so hardworking and useful to man with so little attention needed for its keep as a bee. Before we get busy with this episode, a reminder that here on The Standard Show, we really get a buzz from your feedback. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts, especially if you listen to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Find and follow us on Twitter at Standard Show and on Instagram at The Standard Show. And check out the show notes for all of the ways to get in touch. Unbelievable. Surprisingly smelly feet. Scientists from the University of Bristol in the UK have discovered that bumblebees have the ability to use their smelly footprints to distinguish between their own scent, the scent of a relative, and the scent of a stranger. 
This is clever because it means that they can improve their success in finding food and avoiding flowers that have already been visited. So, Selwyn Wilkins is Senior B Ecotoxicologist in the Centre for Chemical Safety and Stewardship at Ferrer and has 30 years of experience in all aspects of apiculture. For over 20 years, he worked within the UK National Bee Unit, where he specialised in honeybee management and disease recognition, diagnosis and control. I spoke to Selwyn about just how important bees are to us and for the environment and the challenges they face from things like intensive agriculture, pesticides and other plant protection products. But I started by telling him a story. Now, Selwyn, I want to, I want to start by telling you a story about something that happened to me when I was a kid. So when I was about 10 or 11 years old, I had this rather amazing experience. So I was on my way back from playing football at the park with my friends and walking back to my mum and dad's house. Now, I grew up on a small estate surrounded by farms and fields. And I got to the end of, of our road and there's a, there's a field at the bottom. And at this point, I managed to lose control of the ball I was dribbling and it dropped underneath a hedge. So I went after it, you know, ducked down, scrabbling around. And whilst grabbing for the ball, I heard what I can only describe as sort of a low droning sound or a rumble coming from what sounded like the end of the field. Now, at that point, I had no idea what it was. So I quickly grabbed the ball and popped my head up to have a look. And the sound was getting much, much louder now. And my eyes met with what looked like a really low cloud, you know, really dark and pretty big and heading for me at quite a speed. It's probably about 50 metres away from me now. And at this point, I was beginning to realise or get an inkling really for what it might be. So I ducked down underneath the hedge and waited for it to pass overhead. And I sat back and had a fantastic view and was just watching it in awe at this enormous swarm of bees which must have been around I don't know five meters by three meters that was going over my head and the noise wow actually quite something so I watched this swarm make its way over the rooftops at the other end of the road and sort of continue on its way and now there was no one else with me that day but since that day I've never met anyone anyone else who's gone through the same thing so it felt to me as if I'd experienced something really quite special so the first thing I want to ask you is, what was going on there? Well, it sounds like you've encountered a swarm. So uh, a swarm is sort of the, the honeybee's way of uh, expanding. So what happens is you'll have a, a colony of bees. Uh, they have a queen in there and she produces queen substance. Uh, lots of bees will either lick her or touch her and they pick up this queen pheromone and then it's passed from bee to bee to bee through the hive. But it breaks down after about 20 minutes or so and um, when the hive gets too big it starts to break down before all the bees can pick up this queen pheromone and that sort of triggers various things and they'll they'll, they'll start to develop uh, or start to build swarm cells um, so which is a, a queen cell they'll build, build queen cells and then the queen will lay eggs in the queen cell this will be fed royal jelly turn into a queen um, and just before it's hatched over uh, sorry just before it's capped over um, the, the old queen and all the flying bees from the hive. So you have house bees and flying bees. Um, but, but about half of the colony will whiz out of the hive, taking the queen with them, and they will go off and they will look for a new uh, a new place to set up a new colony. So what happens is they start, they'll, they'll all pour out of the hive in their, in their thousands, swirl about, and then they gather, and then they'll set off in one direction. And... Uh, they may they'll, they'll eventually settle somewhere and then they send out little scouts go out and they start looking for a new house and they come back and tell the others where that they think oh this would be a good place to go this will be a good place to go um and then the more bees that say this is a good place to go then they'll all follow move they move off and, and and settle somewhere else and set up shop so wow so that was half, probably half a colony then so half a colony of left and have i remembered it right is it you know four or five meters across would that would that be right that's fine yeah that, yeah i mean when they swarm they'll come out and they are, you know if you're standing in the atrium when, when a colony starts to swarm they all start swirling about and buzzing it's, it's it is really quite impressive to see and how many bees would that have been for half a colony Gosh, I mean, uh, a colony will be something at the height of the season. They can be something between twenty to 80,000 80, bees. 
goodness um, me. I, I suppose, and, and, talking a lot of bees. Yeah, I mean, and, and is, it, is it rare? I mean, was I pretty privileged to have witnessed this? Would, you know, it's, I mean, I've never seen it again, as I said. I've never spoken to anybody else who's ever seen it. Was it a rare thing that I saw? I mean, I, uh, if you're a beekeeper, probably not. I mean, you should manage your bees and try and reduce the amount of swarming. Um, but it's just, I think it's a case of being in the right place at the right time. Um, I'm guessing not many people have seen it. So, so when I want to come back, I want to come back to honeybees and honey. But generally, you know, the big question, I suppose, why are bees important to us? Bees perform a whole host of uh, what's called ecosystem services. Um, so they are hugely important for pollination of uh, a, a vast percentage of crops um, and wild plants. So I think uh, the 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 statistic is, I think, something like uh, every third mouthful of food is produced, uh, relies on pollination by insects. Now, that's not all bees, um, but they play a, a major role in it. Not just honeybees, um, as I mentioned, but, but the, the solitary bees and the bumblebees all play a massive role in pollination of both crops and wild plants. Uh, they all have their um, different advantages. So uh, some of the the solitary bees are way more efficient at pollinating plants, so uh, you need less visits from solitary bees in orchards, for example, uh, than you would need from honeybees in an orchard to pollinate them. They're, they're, they're more efficient. Uh, and then bumblebees can work at much lower temperatures than honeybees can, so on, on maybe those colder, colder days, uh, the bumblebees will be out working, but you may not see honeybees. Um, as well as the honey. So, you know, uh, there's honey plus other high products. So, they, you know, they produce wax, uh, which are, we're, you know, this is why um, you see in churches, like uh, a lot of monks used to keep bees. Um, and they used to keep bees because, uh, well, for a number of reasons. One, because of the wax for their candles in the church or in the, in the monasteries. And secondly, probably more importantly for them for producing stuff like mead uh, 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 and beer and alcohol. So uh, a lot of the monks uh, have, uh, were ahead of the game on brewing. Uh, yeah, and then you have other uh, propolis, which is like a sticky. Um, it's like a, the, the bees collect resin from buds from plants. So plants like uh, horse chestnut. If you, you know, if you've seen a remember when you were a kid when you were looking at the the trees on the horse chestnut, the buds are all sticky. They collect that sticky resin from plants and they collect it from paper. Uh, plants like pine and they take it back and they use it as glue so they, they, they fill up gaps with it they mix it with wax and they, they draft proof the hive with it um, but it has the propolis has a lot of antibacterial properties so um, a lot of people will um, use this uh, for therapeutic medicines etc uh, you speak to a beekeeper will try and sell you anything out of a hive so they'll, they'll, they'll sell you the wax the pollen the honey uh, the bee stings, so a lot of people use that for therapeutic uh, treatments as well. You mentioned about crop pollination there at the beginning, and I know you said that um, bees aren't not the only sort of insect responsible for, for helping with that. I suppose, you know, to ask a sort of a counterfactual question, what would happen though if bees didn't exist? Uh, I think that's a very difficult question. I, you, you hear... Um, I think, it's Einstein, I think it was Einstein that he's quoting, I'm not sure if it's a correct quote or not, but saying if the bees died, we would have 10 years to live. Um, I don't know if that's completely true. Um, it's one of those things that nature pours a vacuum. Um, so other insects are able to pollinate the plants, but I think, you know, I say the bees are, are massively important and, and uh, particularly managed honeybees. That's another thing because the honeybee colonies are so large. Uh, you know they, they are quite important for the pollination. I mean, you describe quite beautifully actually the sort of re- the interrelationship between uh, between humans and bees. There's a there's a, there's a crossover. Um, their importance in terms of pollination, but also the products that that that, that come from bees and and how humans use those. I just wonder what challenges do pe- what challenges bees face from humans. I think one of the biggest challenges that. Uh, Sort of all the bees face is a sort of habitat loss, really, as, as, as sort of humans sort of change the, the face of the, the countryside and towns. We're expanding. Um, you know, we, we've lost a, 
a lot of our habitats have, have, have changed since the you know the 30s and 40s and 50s. Um, Agriculture has become more intensive. Sort of a lot of hedgerows have been taken out, and I think that has been. I think that I think that that's one of the key areas that has put pressure on pollinators. Uh, not only honeybees, but uh, you know our butterflies and flies and hoverflies have all been affected by the same thing. Um, I know, um, you know they mentioned people are probably going to mention pesticides. So I, I, I think you know obviously pesticides. We 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 took the decision back in the 40s, 50s to use pesticides, and our, our agri agricultural system relies on fungicides, uh, plant protection products, so fungicides, herbicides, and insecticides. And at some point, they may come into conflict with um, insects. Um, but actually, as I, as I mentioned, that's part of my role is uh, and uh, the you know the, these tiered testing schemes and registration of new pesticides. Obviously, it's, it's, it's in nobody's interest to market um, pesticides which are um, detrimental to the environment. So um, you know it's sort of a, there are these testing schemes, and that, that's what sort of a, a lot of the work that I do um, and the guys that I work with. Um, looking at other, not just bees, but beneficials, um, trying to sort of uh, make sure that these pe uh, sort of pesticides are as, as safe as they can be in the environment. Um, I think the, the, the profile of pesticides has changed over the, the you know the last number of years. Um, you know, initially pesticides were very broad spectrum. You, you know, um, so they, they were not uh, non-targeted. How they're applied. Uh, applications have changed, so you know it, it, it's changing. I think it's better and and, and uh, fairer part of the wildlife incident investigation scheme, which is a, a scheme that's um, it's it's kind of it's, it's managed by um, the HSE, the Health and Safety Executive, um, and by uh, CRD, uh, the uh, <coughs> excuse me uh, chemical regulations um, uh, division. Uh, which is a part of the HSE, uh, and it's a scheme which is set up uh, to monitor post-registration problems. Um, so it's funded by a levy on the sale of plant protection products. So the you know the the more you sell, the more your company pays into that scheme, and it looks at uh, suspected poisoning incidents uh, of um, all animals, so that's birds, mammals, uh, and, and as part of the scheme, bees. Also come under that monitoring scheme, and so if if somebody comes across um, some bees which I think they may have been poisoned, they can actually collect those bees, send them into Ferra, and as part of the scheme, these uh, will be analysed for pesticide residues, and to see <clears throat> if we can find out what caused the, the death of the bees. Now I know that. Um... Certainly in the UK, there's been some, in, in recent years, some quite high-profile campaigns around bees. You might remember Bee Cause was one, wasn't it, a few years ago? And you, you talked there about, about lack of habitat or reduced habitat and, and pesticides. I just wonder, where are we then with bees? Are, are, are bees making a recovery? You know, what, what's the current situation for bees? It's a good question. I think, I like say, I think some Bumblebees, I think, are under threat. I think some of the on the red list and uh, this habitat and maybe climate change also, which I didn't mention. I think climate change is going to affect distribution of bees in the country as well. Uh, but honeybees, I think honeybees are doing okay. Uh, we've got something like that over the it. I think we have something like uh, close to two hundred and fifty thousand colonies of bees. I think in the UK, with something like thirty odd thousand beekeepers. Um, and that's been fairly constant over the last few years, the number of bees. I think we have good years and bad years. Um, and what I failed to mention, what I was going to say earlier, you say, um, you're saying what challenges do bees face from humans? Um, bees also cha uh, face challenges the same as, the, the same as we do. Uh, they suffer from pests and diseases as well. So there are several or a couple of notifiable bacterial diseases which affect bee brood. Um, there was it was a, a something called a parasitic mite called uh, Varroa destructor, which um, is a small parasitic mite that reproduces in the brood of the colony, and they actually suck the hemolymph out of both the developing larvae and from the adult bees, 
um, sort of debilitating the bees. They also act as uh, vectors of viruses and put additional stresses onto the bees. Um, and this, when I first, I started, I've been working in bees since 1991. Um, and when I started, we didn't have varroa in the UK. And you could do you, something what you could call let alone beekeeping. So if you had a colony of bees at your bottom of your garden, if you, if you looked after them, you fed them uh, and uh, make sure they didn't get any foul brood, then you would, you know, come the next year, you'd have a colony of bees at the bottom of your garden and they, they would be quite happy. Thank you very much. But in 1992, um, we were we were looking for it uh, as, a, a, as an invasive. We'd been screening for it. And in 1992, we actually found uh, that Varroa had made its way into the UK, whether that was through um, uh, illegal imports or um, we'll, we'll never know how it got into the country. Uh, but uh, it's now sort of widespread uh, and there's not a colony of bees on the mainland that doesn't have varroa um, and you have to manage that. If you don't manage it, your colony will die out. Most beekeepers in the UK are what we've called hobbyist beekeepers. So I think the most, uh, the average number of hives that the beekeepers manage in the UK is somewhere I think between one and five. Um, we do have um, bee, what, we, what, what are called bee farmers, uh, commercial beekeepers in the UK. Um, there are several uh, beekeepers who have well over a thousand colonies and manage well over a thousand colonies uh, and, and, and make a very good living from beekeeping. But the majority of beekeeping in the UK is, uh, I would say, hobbyist beekeepers. So have maybe, maybe one to five um, and either produce honey for themselves. A lot of them will sell honey across the garden gate. Um, or maybe sell it to, in, within honey cooperatives um, and, stuff. and then places like Poland, France, Germany, there are a lot of commercial beekeepers there. In, in the States, uh, it's done on a massively commercial scale. You'll see huge lorries with uh, bees stacked on pallets, stacked on uh, articulated lorries and they move, uh, for example, uh, the almond harvest in, 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 in California or the almond trees rely on honeybees for their pollination so beekeepers will drive across the states and they move as crops flower across the states they move them it's, it's, it's uh, on a, a, an industrial scale it's very different to uk beekeeping so g- given you given you've been working in, the, in this field since since 1991 here what still motivates you to to work with bees it's good fun uh I, there's nothing I found it was a bit bizarre. I, I, I don't do as much hands-on beekeeping as I used to. I do a lot of stuff in the lab, um, but there's nothing quite as satisfying as going out and, and doing some beekeeping, some hands-on beekeeping. You're in the colony. It can be quite therapeutic um, if, they, if it's a, you know, a nice. It's not too hot. It has to be not too hot, and the bees have to be nice temperament. Uh, but it, it's very nice. I remember uh, during um, lockdown, I went out and did some beekeeping. Um, because you know I, I had to go out and manage the bees, and we couldn't just leave them. And it was the first time I'd properly been out for a while and outside, and, and it was it was just so nice on my own in the middle of the countryside, just me and the bees. Uh, it's brilliant. Unbelievable! Bees can dance. Well, kind of. Honeybees have a dance move called the waggle dance. It's not actually a real dance move, but instead it's a really smart way for honeybees to communicate between themselves to tell their nestmates where to go and find the best source of food. It took the researchers at Sussex University in the UK two years to decode the waggle dance. Selwyn had mentioned how After 30 years of working with bees, he still enjoyed getting out and doing a spot of beekeeping. Now, I knew I wouldn't be able to do that, but I did want to get a bit more up close and personal with some of our tiny furry friends. So I went along to Bee Urban, a community and not-for-profit organisation based in South East London. In fact, just tucked into a nice little corner of Kennington Park to meet beekeeper Barnaby Shaw, one of the founders of the organisation. His group of extremely friendly volunteers, and of course, his honeybees. The Urban's a uh, kind of a community, environmental, uh, kind of non-for-profit organisation. 
so we're based in South London and um, yeah we're our kind of one of our focuses is obviously honey bees and managing bees and supporting bees generally um, but yeah we do a lot of work with in the local community about trying to I suppose have that wider context about supporting pollinators and also kind of getting back into nature and growing for bees and humans in terms of uh, food uh, products really I suppose to a certain extent or consumable uh, fruit and veg uh, to a certain extent uh, so yeah we, we do kind of lots of volunteering with local residents who come and get involved and we've run over the years like uh, worked with uh, tenants and resident associations to kind of do uh, kind of those kind of endeavours um, and then yeah we have quite a few uh, apiary spaces around London as well so we've got, we have a few in a, a few parks in Lambeth um, and a few other areas uh, around London um, and yeah so our kind of yeah focus is on honeybees to a certain extent and then but then we yeah also make habitats for wild bees solitary bees and and birds and bats and what have you and do other things that to engage with our local community really it's a, it's an absolutely beautiful space you've got here i just want to and your role for the for beer and what do you do with others uh kind of started up really i suppose and kind of uh, is, is the main i suppose driving force uh, behind it to a certain extent so I, I kind of lead on the beekeeping side of things and then um yeah try to push coax uh be urban in a certain uh way i suppose to a certain extent <laughs> yeah and tell me about tell me about the, the hives we've got how many hives do you have we've, we've got quite a few more hives at the moment so i think we had like nine hives go through the winter um but yeah we've had a we've had some interesting start to the season in the sense of we've had quite a few of these hives come through the winter very well populated and we've been trying to manage swarming so we've had a quite a joke i kind of chuckle a bit because we've been trying to manage swarming and at this apiary it's first time in my 16 years beekeeping we've had probably five swarms from this apiary alone so i think we've had a few cast swarms um and um, main swarms as well so we've been capturing these swarms and putting them back into new boxes which is not the ideal scenario of, of making up new stocks and groups but is this the swarming is this where they're trying to leave time to leave the hive yeah so it's where they it's kind of for honeybees it's kind of natural propagation or where, where they divide and split and make a new entity um so yeah so it's quite it's quite important for honeybees and like like other social bees like bumblebees that the queen can't make her own grouping uh, and and there's a kind of a, a symbiotic relationship between the, the worker bees and the queen bees for honeybees and yeah so it's where they split and um quite a large percentage of the population will go off with the old queen to potentially find up find a new residence if we can't capture them and uh and yeah find a new yeah find a new home to kind of take up take up space uh, to make up space and in terms of number of bees here i mean how many how many each hive is a, is a colony so how many how many yeah, bees so in total would you say we've got so we've got uh let me just count them <laughs> uh, we've got six kind of main hives and then we've got we have got quite a few nucleus hives at the moment so this is the swarm um hives that we place and introduce swarms if they're not so big uh, into initially and then as we grow them on we monitor them we then might put them into a new hive if we're willing to keep that so we've got I think we've got uh, probably a similar number if not more um, nuke box, nu- nucleus boxes or nucleus boxes yeah we would call them really so yeah it's probably eight nucleus boxes at the moment so we've yeah so we've either captured swarms or we've tried to divide them to split them to, to kind of slow that, that process down um, but yeah we're, we're kind of like swarming seasons probably kind of from from april through to kind of midsummer and yeah that's kind of one of the roles that we 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 find ourselves doing is trying to manage that earlier in the season and um yeah and in terms of each individual hive that on average how many bees will be inside one um sorry yeah so numbers uh i think some of the colonies here might be pushing on like 30 40 thousand bees but some of the nucleus hives depends on the size of the group by the swarm or how far on they've they've, um, they've grown on as an entity but yeah they're probably you know five five to ten thousand bees maybe in some of the nuke, nuke boxes we've got so it's quite a considerable amount and you yeah, talked yeah. there about about the season and obviously we're, we're recording this in may yeah. um what what's going on in for, for bees at this time of year so it's, we, we kind of have what we call um uh kind of spring build-up if you like so it's where we have population growth so normally through the winter months the honeybee groupings the populations kind of contract a bit so the numbers kind of uh, kind of shrink to a certain extent and then we have this spring build up um, and that's what we're trying to w- earlier in the kind of late 
uh, late winter, early spring, we're trying to encourage that build up. And now we're just trying to allow them to expand naturally, obviously trying to monitor swarming, which we've kind of failed to do to a certain extent here. But uh, but it's, it's all good. Um, um, so we're kind of giving them more space. So we well, with, the, with our main hives, we'll give them extra space to move into as the population grows. Um, it's been a really good start to the season for us, I think, generally. I don't know how, if that's all the case, you know, for, for lots of beekeepers. I think, I think on the whole, it probably has been. It's been, re- been really mild winter, quite a warm start. Um, and, yeah, they're, they're actually bringing quite a lot of honey. So we actually have been harvesting. So, yeah, we have been harvesting honey, which is very early for us. And it's the first time we've harvested this early in years. I don't, I don't, I don't recall the last time we've harvested in really early spring. And how, so, yeah. how much honey would you be producing each year? Uh, so it's not it's not uh, it's not a vast amount. Um, so obviously, we've got quite a few hives here. But I think I think we this April we've kind of had about 15 kilos per hive. But it's not a great amount, and there's a lot of work put into to kind of yeah making sure they're okay and healthy and and and, and stable. And uh, yeah, so it's not a vast amount. I think I'm not I'm not too sure what the national average is, but I'm sure it's it's pretty low. But above, uh, but above and beyond honey, I mean, how how important um, a role does this environment play and the bees play in sort of the natural habitat of where we are in South East London? Uh, well, I like to think it has a big importance. I mean, obviously pollination and the needs that that, that generally we have. I mean, it, it's kind of what, it's really important for us uh, because we can communicate that to to young uh, groups, uh, you know, schools and school and kind of venture play groups or um, youth groups that come and visit us our, our space. So it's really good to kind of have that communication side of things in terms of pollination, pollination services, and how. Uh, Bees pro- provide a you know vital role to actually help boost uh, production in agricultural systems. So for us, that's you know a good message to convey and to, to talk about. Um, so yeah, I, I would have hoped that also they're doing that in terms of pollinating flowers from trees or other crops locally. Uh, that hopefully means that that, that you know, that tree has a legacy or that fruit you know can bear as well so yeah so i, I hope that does play a bigger role obviously it probably ha- plays a bigger role in you know out in kent at the moment where all the apple trees are blossoming and and whatnot so but yeah but definitely for us i mean we've got high population densities people aren't you know haven't got the luxury of, of a garden space possibly not a balcony a lot of the messages from local councils are not to plant or have planters or pots on those spaces as well so enabling people to kind of access the environment and nature is really important for us and to kind of you know usually i think over the years i think possibly you know bees have had like you know scare stories or what have you and there's a slight um you know kind of um apprehension around them and i think hopefully that you know us being in a space like this and in the heart of a city can help kind of quell those issues and hopefully raise concerns as well if there are any well i suppose i, I i'm going to test my calmness now because i think do you think the bees will be, behave if we're going to have a bit of a closer look <laughs> that be I'm all right sure should we have a go uh, behave we haven't antagonized them to uh too so which is the best one to have a look at here I don't know. Just move around the the back of this. Yeah, so we're we're approaching the back and then we're pretty busy at the moment foraging. It's quite a nice day. Like yesterday, it was pretty. um, pretty So you're just opening the top there and having a look there. Yeah, and it's not too busy this one. I think maybe. Maybe move along to the. Yeah. Oh, there's one. um, Oh, oh, I'm going to move that there. Nearly knocked it over. That would have been a disaster, wouldn't it, if I knocked over the hive? So this is a wooden boxed one. So what did you describe this as? Um, so this is, it's called a national hive. Um, we've got it on slightly deeper frames. So it's actually a, uh, a slightly deeper 14 by 12 national hive or a British standard hive. Um, so it's a wooden, wooden fronted, wooden um, box itself. You don't know how much uh, that pleases me for you to say a British standard hive there. Yeah, British standard, <laughs> yeah, it's a PS one. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. So this is this is them. I mean, so they're pretty. They're pretty. So you're just lifting the top so of the, the top, top off, off there. Again, see if we can get it off without disturbing too much. There's see. A few bits. I mean. So how many layers? So how many layers have we got? What? How many layers with this hive out? Has, has, has so it got? got? So we've got the deeper brood box, which I just described, the 14 by 12, and then we have these two upper boxes, which are really essentially the honey boxes. Um, and so I think this might have been one of our naughty bees that swarmed but uh, so there's, there's still quite a lot of activity and there's quite a lot of population so they're pretty active I don't know without opening up completely what scenario there is in terms of honey so these shallower boxes are what we call the um, 
the super boxes uh, beekeepers refer to them as and that's the honey that we might harvest at the end of the season maybe around July um, that we yeah hopefully might make gain from them like I say we've been pretty lucky and had a little bit of a harvest already not from this apiary from another a couple of other apiaries um, but yeah so we've got two supers on so we might have some honey in here I think there probably is in, in, in partially on one because we've, we've given them extra room to expand so. I've got to, to say that we look, I'm looking at the top of the, the, this beehive and there are quite a lot of bees in front of me here and also we've also caused a bit of disturbance because they're now completely surrounding me yes. so I'm doing okay at the moment I mean describe what, the, what these bees are doing on top here uh, well I think we've just opened them up so they're just kind of coming up to these kind of open spaces we've got one is, which has landed just here with pollen on its hind legs there's pollen sacs there um, so that, that, that'll be returning with these these protein sources of food for the for the bees for the collective um, but yeah I mean they're foraging really well like I said it's, it's a really nice bright spell of the day so they probably are bringing back food the guys in here hopefully they are processing that nectar and storing it away normally the pollen will be stored more into the in the brood area um, so probably the, the top area we're looking at now on, on the crown board we probably will have um, worker bees that will be processing honey hopefully um, we hope <laughs> and the, the, the queen where would the queen be in this in this hive so she will be in that lower box that brood box so i think for like european honeybees you will have a lower deeper brood box where the queen will be living um always the entrance which is kind of is open all year round will be at the base of the brood box and then yeah like i said as we as we go through the season we'll add these shallower upper boxes that that provide hopefully space for them to expand into but hopefully if we're lucky enough might have some honey yield uh, that we can remove away so the, the brood box there will be hopefully honey in that in that area which should sustain them through the winter months so that's something again we monitor as we go through the course of the season usually kind of late summer we want, want to see more honey in that brood box uh, and that, that usually will be the case uh, but that's something we we monitor when we're when we're inspecting them just that a bee has landed on my hand now so i'm just feeling very very conscious of it the um just how much work is involved and in sort of is this a day a daily basis in terms of looking after the bee do, just, do things have to be done every day uh, no, I think so. If you know, if you're a hobbyist beekeeper, um, you, you, you know, you're really going to check a hive maybe once a week, and that's kind of to try and synchronise your inspections with uh, swarming. Uh, there's also other things we're monitoring. Food we've just spoken about, and that's, that's something we do try and monitor, make sure that there's food within the hive, and, and that, again depending on the time of the year uh, that they've got food to, to survive through the winter. Uh, we're checking for uh, pests and diseases, which is quite a big thing, especially in you know kind of urban areas where there's quite a, you know quite a density of, of, of beekeepers around um so that's something we monitor and look for um and then we you know we're, we're looking to see that all's normal with the hive in the sense of there's a queen bee and she's laying properly uh, and we're checking always that the bee have, bees have space and it's quite important this time of year for that so um yeah um so yeah during as we go into the winter months we kind of will reduce the the uh, internal capacity so we'll start removing these honey boxes and we don't tend to keep as many on through the winter months so again they've got haven't got as much volume in terms of space inside the hive to warm and they can hopefully huddle and be a bit bit warmer as a collective uh yeah and a cluster um well, I'm just what i'd say actually we are i'm surrounded here by the bees and they are, they are swirling around me and landing on my head landing on my hands but they're they're quite quiet so i expected it to be a lot of noise is that when they make more noise is that when they're a bit more disturbed is this a normal this is the the lack of sound is that normal um this is quite normal yeah i mean so i don't so i think like so it's, it's afternoon sun the clouds the clouds just cover up some a little bit so i don't think they're foraging in vast numbers i think certainly we've, we've had these swarms that i've mentioned already they're a little bit noisier and they tend to fly more localized as well to orientate and gather and they kind of move like a, a large collective when they're swarming so i think when they're on a mission just to forage they're kind of in and out straight away and it's not as busy unless you know have a cold spell of the day and it goes really warm and bright and they rush out um sometimes you might hear them buzz a bit more but this is quite a a low pitch kind of buzz that is quite normal yeah for foraging activity yeah i would say Barnaby spontaneously mentioned, much to my delight as you heard, that one of his highs was to British Standard. He was referring there to BS 1300, first issued in 1946. And it's on the issue of standards, though not for hives, but for bee products, that I spoke to Adrian Charlton, principal scientist at Ferra, and an expert in the contaminants and allergens that threaten a sustainable food supply chain. 
He is also chair of the UK Bee Product Standards Committee for BSI and also involved in the Food Assurance Kite Mark. I spoke to him about the relatively new international standards being developed for bee products and in particular for honey. But I started by asking him about his standards journey. It's quite an interesting story. I, I've um, got a background in protein biochemistry and um, we, we were interested in more sustainable um, sources of protein. And, and one of the areas that we're, we're looking at um, to, to introduce sustainable protein into, into food and, and particularly into animal feed is, in, is insect derived protein. So protein from, from farmed insects. Um, and at the time we were, we were looking at that very closely um, and we needed some, we needed some help with, um, with setting the industry up and, and getting um, the regulators in, engaged well. And one of the things that was missing across the whole of the insect space was, was a standard. Um, you know, this is a, a new, new industry. And so on, on, on that basis we, we approached um, the British Standards Institution BSI um, to help us with with that and that's that's an ongoing piece of work but it it also turned out that we got lots of other common interests so we're, we're working together with um, with BSI to look at standards for, for honey for example and for, for some of the more novel um, protein sources so things like cultivated meat we're heavily involved with with that as well now so um, it was a particular problem that we, we were facing at the time but um, it's resulted in a um, you know, a long-term collaboration between Boa and, and BSI. Now, actually, we were we were talking uh, before we started recording this, Adrian, weren't we? Your part of your journey involves uh, Sheffield in, in South Yorkshire. We discovered a a personal connection uh, with the Steel City because we were both postgraduates uh, living in Sheffield and studying at the same five-year period within probably within sort of five hundred meters of each other. <laughs> Should we say um, <laughs> maybe some time ago, rather than give the precise dates for that? Oh yeah, I certainly don't think I'd, I'd like to give my age away these days. But um, yeah, that, that's true. <laughs> and we were wondering, wouldn't we? We were wondering whether we'd probably, you know, drunk in the same pubs um, on West Street during that time, the Hallamshire Hotel and places like that. You know, watching footy at the same time, but without realising. I just wonder if you ever, you ever get back to Sheffield at all? Yeah, occasionally. So um, I'm originally from South Yorkshire in that area, so I do go back to to visit family and friends occasionally. And it's changed a lot. I think um, a lot of the roadworks have disappeared since we were there. They were building the tram at the time when we were down there. So that probably dates us both. It does. Yes, they, 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 it felt like they were working on the tram forever. And then as soon as they finished it, I, uh, I left. So uh, I suffered all of that <laughs> disruption, but never benefited from the superb tram system that Sheffield now has. Um, Adrian, you were talking there about the relationship with BSI. I just want to explore your your role as a standards maker. How are you involved in standards at the moment? So on, on several different levels, um, I, I sit on various different committees. Um, a lot of those relate to, to honey and to, and to bees and that sort of thing. So um, I actually chair the UK Bee Standards Committee um, and that or bee, bee Products Committee, um, which is involved for taking a, a UK position into international organizations such as um, the International Standards Organization or ISO as we know them. Um, so I represent as a, as a national expert on, on an ISO committee for uh, for bees and, and honey, um, the, the, the opinion of the, of the UK. Um, but I'm, I'm also involved in various other um, committees and, and decision making processes. So we work with the European Standards Body, which is known as CEN, um, and we also are involved with organizations such as Codex. Um, to help, particularly around alternative proteins, to help to give a, um, a clearer view of what um, the UK position is in the, with these emerging technologies. Now, I want to come back to some of those standards and that committee work that you do. But just to sort of kick us off here, what do we mean by bee and honey products? What are we talking about here? So the, the, the main thing is um, that comes from, from um, farming bees is honey. Um, but there are other things. There's something called propolis, which is another bee product, and obviously things like beeswax and honeycomb. Um, we, we we see come out of beehives that have um, you know, much bigger markets outside of the UK. So things such as royal jelly, um, which is uh, one of the higher quality products that comes out of the beehive, um, has a very big market in, in China. And it's not a huge thing for us in the UK. Um, so this is why international cooperation is required, because we need to, to work together with people who have interests in, in all aspects of um of bee management and ultimately you know if we, if we can manage the products that, and the um, safety of those products we're, we're helping to manage the bees themselves and um, that's the other aspect really it, it's to manage the, the bee health and we've, we've seen um, issues with with um, pollinators um, declining 
and that that would um, ultimately lead to a, a shortage of, of food um, if, if the, the fields are not pollinated. So by by managing the um, the, the the honey and, and the, the environment in which the bees live, we can manage the health of the bees as well. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. So you know, generally, why are international standards being developed for for bee and honey products? I think the, the first and, and simple answer is trade um, to make sure that people are trading in the in the, the same commodities. And so when we we um, decide to buy some honey from um, a foreign country, that we we get what we expect because at the moment honey does mean different things to different people in different parts of the world. And there are certain practices that are permitted in um, in the UK, for example, um, that may not be quite as as as, as widespread in, in different parts of the world. And certainly that's true vice versa. Um, so we need to get into a room and talk about that and, and make sure that we, we all clearly understand what um, what we're getting when we when we buy honey. Now, that, that ultimately allows a consumer to have confidence that what they're buying off the shelf is what they expect. But um, in reality, the implementation of the standards is, is at the level of trade to make sure that any buying organisation knows what they're getting. Um, and then when they pack the honey and it goes on the shelves, that um, we can have confidence in that in our supply chain. Now, you just mentioned there about honey meaning different things, different people. So is there is there some controversy then over what sort of the definition of honey? There, there is there are certain practices that are permitted in different parts of the world. So it's common practice in the United States, for example, to filter out the pollen from honey. Um, but that isn't permitted within Europe. Um, and there are, there are good reasons to want to do that. You know, um, allergies and that sort of thing being one of the major, major motivators for, for filtering the, the honey. Um, but it's yeah, there, there are other practices as well, such as um, bee feeding is a big big thing. So in the winter we have to feed bees to keep them alive, um, and that's more acceptable, I guess, um, during the winter periods than it is when the nectar's flowing. So um, again, we, we we have to keep a close eye on who's doing doing what to make sure that the the honey doesn't become contaminated with winter feed, which is generally sugar that sort of thing. Um, and there, there are issues as well around how we can uh, process the honey. Um, you know, how it can be filtered and, and, and that sort of thing and also looking at things like moisture content in honey how we can control that so that there's lots of very technical things that need need um, a description to, to, to allow us to understand what it is that, that's been done to a particular jar of honey depending on um, you know, where you bought it and I think it'd be very difficult to, to standardize a jar of honey but it's not so difficult to standardize the processes associated with that um, you've got to remember that honey is a, a natural product and yeah, the bees will have foraged on different plants and different flowers um, depending on, on where the honey comes from. So we're always going to have that local feel to a jar of honey. But um, what, what we need to agree at an international level um, is what permitted practices are. And, and when there are a range of different permitted practices, which, which ones have been applied? So in a sense, honey is honey and the bees produce it. But turning it into a product that can be sold, that's where there are areas that need to be resolved in terms of, you know, it could maybe controversial areas or, or issues around how that honey becomes then a food product? I think it's along the whole chain, actually, from um, beekeeping practices such as winter feeding, as I've mentioned, through to, um, as I mentioned, blending and, and moisture reduction and, and what needs to happen to get the, the, the honey to, um, you know, in, into, the, into the jar. Heating is another issue as well. You know, you, you can heat honey, but not, not too much. So it's about controlling the practices along the whole chain. Now, before I ask you about the particular standards that are in, in development, is this a particularly new area of work? You know, are, um, in terms of international standards, this, is this a new area of work for, for standards makers to get together and agree good practice around bee products? Um, I think we've been working on it for about three years now, so it, it's relatively new. Um, I think, think there, there have been other systems in place that have worked very well. So I mentioned Codex previously. There's been a codex standard for, um, for honey for a long time. What, what we're developing at the moment is, is something called an ISO standard. Um, and that allows us to, to look a little bit more closely in, in some respects at the industry practices um, and, and to take in all the good work that's been done from, from codex and at the regulatory level and build that into um, a commercially applicable standard that, um, that the industry can follow and, and can use to evidence what they've been doing as well. You said that it's been a sort of uh, three three years or so. I wonder what what's been the driver then for this development. Why now? Why why create these international standards now? I, I mean, I guess you'll have you've seen that there's been some um, mixed publicity around honey and particularly around honey authenticity. 
Um, so what we're trying to do is to define the practices, the permitted practices, um, and to de and define the different categories that um, everybody might fall into. Um, and in doing so, you know, we, we, we create consumer confidence and that will um, you know, allow us to be able to, to address some of the, the potential negative publicity about um, authenticity issues, whether whether honey has been adulterated with sugar, for example, keeps coming up in the press. Well, we can we can use a standard and show adherence to that standard as a, by by way of, of countering any arguments that, um, that honey might have been um, subjected to fraud. Now, Adrian is a member of ISO Technical Committee 34, subcommittee 19, responsible for standardisation of bee products. It has produced an international standard for royal jelly specifications, ISO 12824, and there are four others currently under development. One for royal jelly production, a specification for bee propolis, one on the specifications for bee pollen, and finally one on the specifications for honey. I asked Adrian to tell me what solution this particular standard is trying to provide. I mean, the standards for the international honey community, really, um, and the solution it's trying to provide is, is harmonisation um, and, and agreement across the world over what, what are permitted practices. So um, even within Europe, the regulations differ. It's not entirely harmonised for, for honey production. There, there are slightly different rules in Germany, for example, compared to the UK. And if you go internationally, then the, rule, the rules change quite a lot. So um, what we need is, a, is a, common, a common rule book that can be shared internationally so that we can trade with all parts of the world and know what we're getting. The standard itself then is, is currently in development? That's right, yes. And in terms of then sort of the, the change that you're looking to, to generate from this when it is being used by organisations, you know, what sort of impact we, are you hoping for it to have? I think it will, um, it will allow people to, to trade more freely um, in honey and, and be able to, to buy with confidence. So we, we, we source honey from all over the world. The very little of the honey that we eat in the UK is actually from the UK. Um, it's sourced from, from, from Asia and from various different parts of Europe and, and even from, from um, the Americas as well. But what we, what we want to know is that um, a honey that, that we buy will, will meet um, the standards that are expected. And, and that, if the ISO standard is, is developed correctly, that's the opportunity really to be able to, to ask our trading partners to, to demonstrate that they've produced um, the product to, to the standard that's been internationally agreed. And that means we, we know that we can buy with confidence. Um, and that ultimately, that means that, that consumers will get what they, um, what they expect, which is a product that naturally um, from, from bees um, and, and you know, doesn't contain any of the things that, that might contaminate it. So things like pesticides, and antibiotics and that sort of thing. Um, so ultimately, the, the standard will provide consumer confidence. Um, but that's through providing um, clear definition or specification um, that we can use when, when purchasing honey internationally. So a relatively new area of, of international standards work and, and you know normally when a, a new a new sort of new work premise program is being put together you know defining your terms is a, is a really important part of that. I just wonder you know taking us inside the committee have there been er any areas of particular contention maybe or sort of uh, you know robust discussion about any of any of the terms that are being used in the development of this standard? Yeah, that they have. I mean, that's one of the reasons for coming together as a committee to, to, to actually thrash out the details. And it is a, a very detailed piece of work. And we, we even have to be very careful about the, the, the language that we use. So um, there's been a, a very long conversation about the term raw, for example, in terms of, of honey. So raw honey um, is a term that's used in the, the international trade, but isn't necessarily recognized within the legislation. And one of the reasons for that is obviously in English language, raw means largely means uncooked. Um, and, and we would hope that all honey is uncooked. Um, so we've had to really finally define what we mean by, by the term raw within the, within the committee and, and then decide if that's an appropriate term to attach to honey, um, which is an ongoing conversation. Well, we've, we've clearly identified that there's a problem um, that needs to be resolved in relation to testing methods. So different testing methods for honey are there to, to again, protect consumers from um, exposure to um, to fraud, but also to, to toxins and, 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 and that sort of thing. So the, the different testing methods generally would, would fall under an accreditation scheme. So um, you would have fully accredited methods and you would have methods that are fully validated. Um, now, some, some well, in, in science, we do like to think that um, we're, we're constantly improving things and developing new technologies and new methods. But sometimes those methods get to the market um, probably before they've been 
internationally accepted by by everybody who who um, is exposed to the results from those test methods and there are a few good examples of that within the honey sector where we've got some some new methods um, so the, the technical terms of things like NMR and mass spectrometry there, there, there are some methods that are being applied um, that are very much cutting edge um, but the, the what hasn't necessarily been agreed is what to do with the results. So we, we could get a test result that would detect something at a very, very low level. Um, and we, as, a, as a group, we haven't necessarily decided whether that low level contamination is of concern or, or whether it's just a natural natural thing. You, you will always get some um, some some elements of, of any natural product that um, you know you, you would prefer not to see there. But if they're at a low enough level, they don't cause any harm. So we, we need to have a, a conversation as a committee, and we are having a conversation as, as a committee, as to how low is low um, and, and set those bars so that when these new testing methods are applied, that we're not overly concerned with things that have been there for, for years and we just couldn't see them before. Um, we, can, we can now start to see things more, more clearly because the technology's moved on. So in terms of the, to the committee's work then, you know, what's next really in, in, its, in its work programme? So we've, we've recently set up two additional groups um, to look at specific aspects of um, the honey standard in particular. Um, and as you'll, you'll appreciate from what, what we've discussed here, that one of them is around analytical methods. So there's a, there's a group um, of specialists um, that are, are putting together an opinion on the state of the art um, methods that, that are being applied to honey. So that's a supplementary piece of work that will feed into the honey standard ultimately, um, but also will be applicable to the other other products within the um, within the group so propolis and, and royal jelly in particular will benefit from the work that we're doing on analytical methods and the second piece of work is around nomenclature so you, again you've, you've heard the example that I've given we're, we're actually having to re redefine the dictionary to some extent to, to apply it specifically to honey because there are some technical terms in in the honey industry that um, you wouldn't be able to find if you if you tried to look them up in in the Oxford English, English dictionary that they're, they're terms that that apply within a specific um, a specific sector. So we need to clearly define what those term means, so that when somebody picks a standard up and they read a, a technical term, that they understand what that means. Probably the important thing to think about setting standards for, for honey is ultimately um, we're aiming to protect the consumer um, and to, to protect the bee populations as well. I mean, bees are a, a very good way um, of, of, of very good pollinators. And honey actually is, is an economic incentive to look after bees. So um, th these sorts of things that, that we're doing within the standards world and with honey and, and bees in general um, you know, apply to, to um, developing economies in, in developing countries. Um, and that ultimately leads to um, you know, pollinators being uh, valued. And, and when they're valued, ultimately, that, that means that the, the environment in which they live is, is valued more. And that can lead to um, you know, more care being taken to, to look after the natural environment. So um, the, the honey and bee story is, is a very good one for helping people to promote um, a healthier environment. Unbelievable. From Earth to the moon. The distance each bee flies in its life is astonishing. Forager bees, for example, can fly about 5 kilometers for food, though an average distance would be around 1.5 kilometers from the hive. But that means a strong colony of bees flies the equivalent distance from Earth to the Moon every day. They are fast too. The normal top speed of a worker would be about 21 to 28 kilometers per hour when flying to a food source and about 17 kilometers per hour when returning with nectar, pollen, propolis or water. Speedy bees. Our thanks to Adrian Charlton and Selwyn Wilkins from Ferrer for speaking to us for this episode and to Tim Webb who leads the BSI Sustainable Standards Network for his suggestions and support. And thanks also to Barnaby Shaw and the wonderfully friendly volunteers at Bee Urban in Kennington, South East London, for allowing me to meet their honeybees and for sitting me down with a cup of tea and biscuit as soon as I arrived. They made me feel very welcome. You can find out more about their work at Bee Urban London on Twitter, and you can also find them on Facebook and on Instagram. And finally, thanks to the World Wildlife Foundation for our unbelievables. Before I buzz off, I'll leave you with one more. The average beehive produces about 11 kilograms of honey during a season. That's the equivalent of about 24 jars. 
which means between them, the bees fly around 88,000 kilometers to help make just half a kilo. Truly unbelievable. You have been listening to an episode of The Standard Show with Matthew Childs and Cindy Paragill. Subscribe to us now wherever you get your podcasts. You just heard a stripped media production.